And last time, uh, last Thursday, we looked at this Lorentz transformation slightly differently as a linear transformation that you can express with a matrix multiplication. Let me just write it down here as a reference. Um, so we are not going to use that representation too much, mainly because you know we haven't yet listed Math 3 as the core architecture for this class. So I'm not allowed to do some you know, linear algebra. But in case you do, um, th in fact, this is how I have this formula memorized. I have it memorized as a, a square matrix, which represents an operation on a column vector or I guess it could be row, or operational column vector. So the Lorentz transformation, the way you can represent it is you can represent it as an operation, a square matrix, four by four matrix, that's going to take this column vector of coordinates, time, position, well, time and position. And actually, let me introduce one more notation which I hope is uh, relatively intuitive. This uh, column vector here, so I could write out all four components of it. One common way people abbreviate it is this way. So CT, the time component by itself, and this, I can represent it with uh, some kind of a position vector. Like if I use this notation, that's not that confusing? Yes, because I might use them more. Good. Okay. Yeah. So this one letter actually represents three different numbers, like any other vector quantities, do, or any other three vector <laughs> quantities. Do. So uh, you can look at Lorentz transformation as a transformation that takes this vector into this vector, and the transformation is written as this. Oh. Written as gamma minus gamma beta zero zero minus gamma beta gamma zero 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 one zero 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 one and I told you guys that this is how I actually remember this. <laughs> it's kind of the only way to memorize it in a way you won't forget. Um, all right. So um, so and there's an analogy of this with the rotation. Uh, that's why we went over last Thursday. When we are dealing with, let me write it down as a reminder. So when you are dealing with the rotation in rotation, the, this is an invariant. Um, the, the vector, that product with itself, this is, uh, which we sometimes call, uh, let me use R as the letter. X is actually going to get confusing. Let me go back and change this too. So people have seen R as representing position vector, yes? Okay, good. So R dotted to itself, or R squared is equal to um, the X component squared plus Y component squared plus Z component squared. This is an uh, invariant. When you rotate your coordinate axis, the length of a vector or length squared doesn't change, right? So with this analogy in mind, what we brought up last time is uh, what we call Lorentz invariant. And um, so we went through this last Thursday. The expression for Lorentz invariant is, well, so you can actually treat this, uh, well, let me put it this way. Um, so Lorentz invariant would be like, um, how do you call it? Um, we can talk about invariant interval. So if you have some um, space time event, event that happens in space time, Let's say you have uh, this particular point here. And um, you can describe this point, which has coordinates C, T, and X. Um, if you just describe these coordinates, then um, that coordinate would depend on what reference frame you are using. If you are using a reference frame that, you know, that's a at some boost relative to your original reference frame, 
then the coordinate for the same point will now be different. Right? The idea behind invariant interval is that you can do something like a length in three-dimensional geometry or you know, two-dimensional geometry. So there's a kind of an idea of length here. Let me call that S that uh, we can define it in such a way that whatever reference frame we use, this s won't change. And the expression for that s, this is how far we got to last time. That um, let's say s squared is equal to, uh, we had the time components first, ct squared minus, and what I wrote then was x squared, right? This is x squared is what I wrote. Let me uh, make this claim now that this x squared really is the position vector dotted to itself. So if I included the, um, the x, y, and z coordinates, this would be the full expression. Okay? And this is what, you would call, what we call, um, uh, this is the result of what we call inner product in the, um, um, in, inner product in the, the Lorentz, um, in the space that obeys the Lorentz transformation. There's a term called the Minkowski space, but that, uh, that's, how far, <laughs> that's the farthest I'm gonna get. So uh, let's put it this way. So if this position can be represented by a four vector, uh, let me, can I use letter R? No, let me use the letter A. And let me just uh, introduce a makeshift notation for four vector, because this four vector, it's different from the vectors we have been dealing with. Because the vectors we have been dealing with, it's one or it's three of the components in four vector. So it's just putting an arrow on top of it, that wouldn't work anymore because that gets confused with three dimensional space vectors. So the notation I've seen in a textbook that I'm also going to use is a squiggly underline. Because I don't think we are using that for anything else yet. Good? <laughs> All right, so let me use that. So one of the ways to represent this is if this space-time event is represented by this A4 vector, then I can say this is what A inner product with A is. That's my definition of inner product in this uh, space-time uh, geometry. It's uh, in some ways uh, similar. You can see that this inner product is a part of the definition here. But it's got this new part that uh, wasn't there before. And actually, um, while, that, uh, while I have this up, let me go over one example that's not on the board that I, that I really should have mentioned a lot earlier is, do you see, uh, let me put it this way. Let's say I have space-time diagram, x, c, t, and let me just draw the uh, light cone line as a reference. So this is a uh, word line for, uh, so word line of light. And um, this is what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine just picking any points at random in this space. You know, you could have picked this point A, you could have picked this point B, C, D, whatever. So uh, let's uh, keep ourselves within first quadrant, but you know, you can imagine picking many different points. And this is my question. When you look at this entire quantity, what possibilities do you see for the pos so this gives you a scalar, right? Simple, single number. What possibilities do you see for that single number with the reference number being zero? So with respect to zero, I don't know, are these always going to be greater than zero? Like this actually is always greater than zero, right? Length, uh, the length of a three vector is always greater than zero, right? Yes? Real number squared plus real number squared plus real number squared. You can get anything other than, I mean, it can be zero if you're right at the origin, but if not, you can, it always is greater than zero. When you look at this, what possibilities do you see? 
both. So uh, you mean, so gauge means both as in this number could be greater than zero, like before, and it could also be less than zero. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Have you? Well, I'm not talking about moving anything. I'm talking about describing space-time coordinate of this event relative to this origin. Yeah, I'm not talking about anything moving. I'm just talking about, okay, I have this point in my space-time coordinate. Like, if I calculated whatever this um, S is, and calculate S squared, what would that be? Actually, let's imagine doing it for this. Will that give me uh, this quantity uh, less than zero or greater than zero? Greater than zero? Like, without plugging in any numbers, how would you know that it gives you a number greater than zero? What, uh, so actually this is going to be a common feature of all the points that lie within the area I'm shading. Like what property is shared by all these different points? Uh, so, you know, why, why so yeah, yeah, yes, this is correct, but like why, what leads you to that? Like on this diagram, what do you see? For these points, that's different from these points. CT is greater than X. CT is greater than X, yes. This word line of light, that represents, a, so this is the set of points. This is the set of points where CT is equal to X, right? Whatever's traveling at speed of light goes as far as C times T in the amount of time T. Good. So all the points here is above that line. So all the points up here, you can say CT is greater than X. So look back here, all right, CT squared. And then, you know, imagine Y is equal to zero, G is equal to zero, then yeah, CT squared minus, you know, X squared um, should be greater than zero because um, you are here. Yeah? And the set of points that have this property, so you know, that results in a value greater than zero, they actually have, um, uh, I guess the interval that looks like that has a name. This is called, this is called time-like interval. Whatever that phrase means. Yeah. So what are the set of points that have, um, you know, that results in uh, this uh, quantity less than zero? Like what set of points would you look at this and say, for those uh, set of points, th when you take the space-time inner product, you're going to get a number less than zero. So yeah, A and B, the things that are to the below or to the right of the, the word line of light, right? So these set of points will result in, C, uh, so they result in less than zero because the CT is less than X. So because of this property, it leads to this being less than zero. And for those set of points, the, we call them space-like interval. And let me just leave with this simple statement. Uh, maybe it's simple, maybe it's not. Um, so when you have your space time drawn up like this, you can divide it up, divide up your, so let's say you are observer here. Then you can divide up all the space that's uh, like, um, you know, that's around you, and all the time that's uh, near where you are right now, uh, you can divide up in terms of uh, what, uh, inter uh, divide up by word line of light. So your textbook talks about light cone. So this would be the, uh, this would be one side of light cone, this would be another side of light cone, and then you have this bunch of areas that's outside the light cones. 
And when you look at it, the intervals that we are calling time-like, those intervals, these time-like intervals, they fall into here in this area, or they fall into here in this area. So if you're an observer sitting here, what would you call events that lie on this side? Or there's a name for it that you may or may not. Um, yeah, I guess maybe I should make a multiple choice. Your choices are future and past. This will be future, right? So this is what you can legitimately call future. The events up here, you can definitively say they have not yet happened. Um, and the events here, you can definitively say that they have happened. This is past. And um, this is why we are calling this time-like interval, because they are separated like in time. But then you might, you know, you could ask this question. Uh, well, what about, well, what about A? Isn't this, is, you could ask also, isn't this future? I mean, you know, it's happening at a time that's later than where I am. So why is this not considered part of my future? Yeah, so Gao just said, if you travel fast enough, that this may not be the future. Does anyone else know? I think I know what it means. Anyone else know, Javier? Because in order to look at it, you would have to be, if light is your line, you would have to move it down. OK, so you, you would see it in the past. so Javier is imagining this. Like, if I want you to see this event happening, then, um, wait, no, no uh, or let's see. Wait, it's not saying, okay, I think it did, maybe this is a better way to say it. If I want to affect what's going on here, so I'm trying to send a signal to that event, I need to have done it in the past, like something like this. That's what you are saying, right? Yeah, and part of that is, this is separated in such a way, if you want to get to the point from here, it'll take, you need to be traveling faster than speed of light. So that's uh, something that will get you thinking, all right, so even though this is technically my future, this is not a point in space and time that I can ever actually get to. Because these are all the points that I can possibly get to if I travel as fast as light. And um, so this is the reason I'm putting up these notes and I want to cover you know, um, special relativity in a little more uh, with more geometry than your textbook does, with more, your textbook actually has space-time diagrams. It's better than Giancoli that way. But I want to do it, uh, use the space-time diagrams more, because this is the understanding I want you to come, up, come away with. For all the points here, you can find a reference frame in such a way that these two events happen simultaneously. Imagine, an observer who's moving fast enough that you can say this is his or her word line. That imagine someone who's moving fast enough for you to do that. So let's say something like this. This is the word line for this uh, hypothetical <coughs> observer you are thinking of. So um, in that person's reference frame, this would be their CT prime axis, right? And so you imagine, all right, let's find my x prime axis. You've seen me draw it. You know what it looks like. My x, oops, uh, I need that point. My x prime axis looks like it's going to go through here. This will be my x prime axis, kind of symmetric around the world line of light. So since along this x prime axis, t prime is equal to 0, what that means is whatever is happening here and whatever is happening here are simultaneous in the moving frames reference frame. So that's why points in this space is called space-like separation. The way I like to think about it is, well, you can find the reference frame so that any points that are like this, you can find them separated by space only and no time. Or you know, if you go faster, then it can be in your past instead of future. 
So, all right, that's uh, probably more on that than I should have spent. Um, and, oh, and just to make sure we cover all the bases, there is actually a possibility for this to equal zero without being at the origin. How do you get this interval to be equal to zero? To be the line. Sorry, someone else. What were we going to say, Dimitri? If you're on the world line of light. Yeah, if you're on the world line of light, then you know this is true, which means ct squared minus x squared will be zero. So this uh, I don't know. I, this is the interval I always forget. I think it's called like uh, light like interval. I think that's what it's called. But um, you know it, it, this is the in any interval that can be connected by light traveling between them would be this. 